are very special too, Fat Lardy's Oddcast. For, for the first time in what seems like ages, we're getting together in person to record this show. And to do so, Nick and I are currently trudging up the long drive to Roundwood Towers. Nick, do you think it'll be a tradesman's entrance job? We've been walking for 10 minutes already and I think we've got about another 15 to go. I, think I can see the house though. It's, yeah. If you look right there by, behind those trees, yeah. the, it looks like a bonsai palace up yeah. there. So I think that must be it. I think you're right. <laughs> well, it's a hot day as well, isn't it? <laughs> I've been done without it today, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have put these trousers on. <laughs> well, I'm glad you got some trousers on, mate. Let's keep going. Let's keep trudging up towards uh, the front door. Right. Oh, look at that. Isn't that lovely? Like wildlife as well. Yeah, yeah. Flora and fauna, mate. Yeah. Flora and fauna. Right, well, here we are. Let's see. Let's knock on. Oh, there's a bell. There's... Gentlemen. Thank you, Parker. Please share them into the hall. Well, Sydney, I don't think I've ever come in through the main hall before. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Any chance of a glass of water after a walk up that drive? It's a hot day and that was a longer walk than we had to <laughs> talk about. It's a long walk. Well, don't worry. I sorted all that out and laid on some refreshments. Uh, Parker, can you fetch the rolls? Very good, sir. Let's move here. Um, let's have a seat. I have to say, it's great to see you both in person. We've been recording remotely for some time now due to busy schedules. Uh, so it's great to be back together. Help yourself to the refreshments. Thank you, Parker. Lovely. And uh, let's take advantage of the weather and uh, just sit out here on the terrace of the hall. So what have you been up to since our last show? Mostly walking up your drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what my Fitbit's going to say. But <laughs> I think I was definitely in fat burn and maybe made cardio with that, with that walk. But yeah, no, it, um, well, it's been a busy time. We've all been really hectically busy. Of course, we had Evesham, didn't we? Operation yeah. Market Love. We did, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, um, the original Lardy Gangster. We went back there again, run by Little Aid Deacon. Uh, and what a, what a job you did of it. We, yeah, uh, it did a great was, job. It was an extended event this year, wasn't it? It was. I had to. Um, I couldn't stay on the Saturday this year, so I went up on the Friday and stayed over on the Friday night. So going up on the Friday, having a bit of a social, Aid organised a, a, a trek to a pub about 16 miles up the river. That, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we started whistling Colonel Bogey on the way it was so far through the jungle. Um, but we got there, really nice, nice evening, good night with the lads, and then the next day was a really good event, I thought. The games were, again, first rate. They just get better every year. Stunning, wasn't it? Yeah. The quality, of the, the visual quality of the games was, was exceptional, and the, the manner in which it was played was lovely. You know, people, people really taking part for the sake of enjoying the game. You know, it's, um, it's, always, it's always great to see the spirit of fun that takes... Mm. Hold in, in a lot of games though, which was great. Some, some really interesting games on display. And um, um, what was it? I was going to say Star Trek. It wasn't. It was. A, <laughs> what's that other one? Star with, Wars. Star mate. Wars. That's it. Star you, Wars. You should remember it because was Princess Leia was there in person. <laughs> if you remember, uh, uh, I do remember Princess Leia. That was that was an interesting spectacle, wasn't it? With, interesting. Um, Fraser dressed up as Princess Leia is a sight I don't think will ever be erased from my memory. But not just any way. Princess Leia, not not the uh, you know the white flowing gowns. This yeah. is the one where she's in uh, Gabba the Hutt's temple yeah. with her with her, with her uh, little gold bikini on. Yeah. The bikini was in evidence. It was quite a sight, but I have to say that the the tables just managed to diminish Fla uh, Fraser's. <laughs> Costume for the occasion. I mean, the tables were really good. I mean, oh, some right. very, very good games there. Well, some great and, games. Right and, uh, great. What did you play, Sid? Are you bonsai bonkers? Well, I, uh, I didn't play that. I played When the Last Sword is Drawn in the morning, <laughs> and then I played What's a Cowboy in the afternoon. Right. Oh, oh, what a game, what a game. Yeah, they're good fun. Did you, which one did you play? Because I think there were, were the two Water Cowboys there. Just, you the, play Aid's one with the sombreros 
And the real tequila, I think, was involved in that game. Is that true? That is true. So we had drinks of tequila. I, um, I happen to have a sombrero from a Mexican straight uh, Texan uh, barbecue a few years back, which I've held on to, culturally insensitive, <laughs> and I also have a poncho. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we were all dressed up in Mexican or uh, American outfits for that, and that was great fun. Uh, but drinking tequila in the morning or shortly after, in the early afternoon, is not to be recommended. <laughs> it does create some interesting tactical decisions. Um, so that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. It was a good time. It was a really nice table because they had his, his, his Snapdragon. Um, yeah, Snapdragon. It looked lovely. Yeah, I've, I've got some ideas of that Snapdragon building. It's no longer made, but I'm yeah. talking to Paul at Sabotage about getting some stuff like windows, doors mm. made that I can then use phone call and render them in uh, polyfiller or whatever and, and, and add those bits too. That's a project I'm really looking forward to doing, but I've actually only just come back from holiday, so I, I need to get back on that horse and get things happening with that. Um, but you, you did your um, harbour attack. Come go, yeah, commander. Yeah, we went commander. We've got the commandos out. So um, <clears throat> it all came together really quite quickly in the end because uh, a week before the game, um, I still hadn't created the dockyard, but thanks to the wonders of Styrofoam, mm. uh, I was able to create the dockyard really quickly. And uh, it looked, I was really pleased with the way the game looked, actually. It might not be an award winning table, but it really gave the right feel. And what I love Styrofoam? Styrofoam. Uh, not that musical thing, no, 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 advertised no, no. by that unusual man with a beard. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Who is no longer with us? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, what was really nice about the table, though, was the uh, the fact that I was able to get Mike Hobbs's submarine on the table. Oh, so I, I had my own submarine. Mm -hmm. I've got the 3D printed one, which was 38 point something inches long. Mm. Uh, and Mike's was a little bit shorter and wider, which I suppose is fitting. It's fitting. Uh, uh, but it looked really nice on there. It had been painted by Vlad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it looked really nice. And we had some, we had some really good games, actually, with that. It was mm -hmm. some good fun. Um, uh, and two very different games, you know, very different game in the morning to a different game in the afternoon, but they're both, well, I think they're good fun. People seem to enjoy themselves. They look great. Well, and we had a great time that. in the evening as well, an excitable crowd right throughout Evesham. It was good. Uh, it was a really a very, good, good night. night. It was a really fun night. Good fun. Had a good laugh um, <clears throat> with, uh, with a lot of people there and uh, spent a bit of time remembering the fabulous artist that was Tina Turner. Oh, yeah. uh, which was great to have a bit of a tribute even to Tina. Uh, and that was nice. And uh, then on Sunday morning, a new addition to the uh, schedule, we all went out for a big, well, not all of us, about 30 of us went out for a fry up at a local calf that was excellent. It's a good good good. It was really good. Yeah, wasn't it? yeah, it was really good. It was one of the best fries I've, I've had for a long time. Yeah. Um, surprising, because you know, when we were going there, I wasn't that convinced that it was going to be as good as it was, but it was really, really... Do you know what I like, mate? Fried bread. Oh, yeah. Fried bread on the menu. None of your hash brown nonsense. Fried <laughs> bread. Good old British stable diet. So, lovely. It was really good, yeah. Have we got that on the menu today, Sid, for luncheon? Uh, we'll we'll have to bread. see what part we're going to rustle up. But, of course, talking of breakfast, you've been up in Scotland. Did you have your square sausage and, uh, I did. and uh, <laughs> I did. those little um, potato thingies? A tatty scone. Yeah. I did. So two weeks after each of them, I went up to meet our um, Scottish friends, uh, Northern English friends at uh, Musselburgh for deep fried lard. And that was a great weekend. It really was. I, I was, couldn't make it this year. And I was I sick about that. My daughter was up from Australia. And uh, that weekend was when she was going back. So I missed it. So tell us all about it. Well, you, you were both missed by all of our friends up there. Mm. But it was a really great weekend. I went up on the uh, Friday and I had a look around Edinburgh on the Friday. I went to a couple of museums, which was great. Mm. And I met all the guys on uh, Friday night. And uh, we, I ran two games of uh, my uh, Japanese, when the last saw his drawn game. On the uh, 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 That you like to call it, yes. On the Saturday, but that was good. But the uh, we said that's a really good hotel, and they did actually give us a, me a Scottish breakfast, which included mm. square sausage. Didn't quite know what that was, and tatty scones, and yeah. lots of black pudding. So that was actually very very good. To get a can good. of McEwan's I didn't get that? any McEwan's. Uh, for, I didn't get McEwan's for breakfast. But I'm a, a big shout out to Doc, Ian, and Scott, and the guys from Air, and of course Derek and Charlie, yeah. and all everyone else who went. To be honest. And um, anyone else who knows me. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who invited me to the uh, air bar, oh, the airship bar, which yeah. was as a travelling um, 
basically a traveling pub. It was quite exceptional. And they presented me with a very nice t-shirt that I'll show you later, which you, <laughs> neither of you have. No. So it's very exclusive. No. Okay. The, the Air Shabam is always one of the highlights it's of the trip. Quite incredible. So. So Alan wasn't there, unfortunately. Uh, best regards to Alan. Yeah. But uh, the T-shirt was well earned. I did it both nights. And, uh, so <laughs> oh, well, well, I'm intrigued to know what yeah. it's got on it now. What did you do uh, both nights? They slipped in a square. Survived. I survived. <laughs> I survived. That's what I did. It might be a T-shirt I'm very glad not to have. <laughs> Uh, and uh, on the Sunday, EasyJet cancelled my flight, which is disappointing. So I spent Sunday evening with Charlie and Andrea, uh, just their Duns. Thank you both to them. That was extremely kind of you to put me up. And uh, had a very nice day on the farm with Charlie. Oh, really? um, creating and building electrical fences for cattle and um, feeding sheep and all the rest of it. So Brilliant. It was, it was good. Did you get a t-shirt for that? Well, I yeah. didn't get a t-shirt yeah. for that. No. Well, maybe next time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so that was that was Scotland. That was brilliant. Thanks in particular for Derek for organising that. It's really great to see Derek and Jack and everyone else who's there. It's, but it's a, it's a, it's a really special event. I, I always say every Lardy Games Day has its own character, yeah. and I think Deep Fried Lard has a really unique Scottish character. It really is. I've, I've, I've never been to Deep Fried Lard. Really I'd be a, I'm a little bit scared of going to Deep Fried Lard. Yeah, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. It's, I don't think I could do that. It's it's absolutely brilliant. I just swore. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really excellent. It's really excellent. But I know you've also been on your travels, Rich. You've been to Crete. I uh-huh. uh, saw some great photos from Malami Airport. Yeah, that was, Airfield, brilliant. Right? that was brilliant. The airfield there is somewhere I've always wanted to go. The Battle of Crete is something I, I studied many years ago. In 2004, we did a Lardy Games Day yeah. uh, uh, on Lard Island, uh, which was based on a uh, German aerial attack on Crete. And it was actually based on the attack from the Vimna, further up the coast uh, to the east. And we had a number of tables which represented the, um, the ground surrounding the airfield. And the airfield was in the, in the centre of that, so the Germans were attacking to try and take the airfield. And, but I did a lot of research into the three areas, Heraklion and uh, Malame, where the airborne invasion took place to decide which to do. And Malame is, is such a critical battle and... Uh, in the end, Crete was lost by an unfortunate error. Nobody's fault, but there was a lot, a, a loss of communication between a battalion commander and his forward companies. He believed that they'd been overrun. He uh, was told to withdraw by his uh, brigade commander, and uh, consequently, the Germans were able to take the critical Hill 107, um, which is now where the German uh, cemetery is, uh, Soldat and Friedhof, which is there. So. I went there to have a look at that and I also had the opportunity to go down to the river where the gliders landed and the old bridge which is there, which has been restored. So that was really interesting. I I have to admit, I went on holiday with the wife uh, and I wasn't going to be spending the whole week going around battlefields. But I did get her to come out on one day with me on a two-stand battlefield tour and she actually really enjoyed it. She was actually quite interested uh, for about half an hour. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was it was it was great and a great opportunity actually once again last year when i went to crete i spent the whole time reading out the cocoa track yeah. in uh, papua new guinea this time i spent the whole time reading about uh the the campaign in burma from mandalay down to rangoon hopefully next year when i go back i'll be able to read about the campaign in crete and actually <laughs> Uh, have a look around a bit more of that. But yeah, great opportunity to recharge the batteries, do a bit of reading. Uh, my girls, we used to come over from the university having what they call a reading week, which was where they did sod all. Um, but I actually, <laughs> I always look on my holidays as an opportunity to make it a reading week and I get, get a chance to do all the reading that I don't get when I'm so busy doing the usual stuff you get when you're running a business. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that brings us nicely mm-hmm. round to yeah. the Far East Handbook. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're still reading about Burma, but I'm guessing mm-hmm. that that must almost be ready. I mean, we've playtested the scenarios at the club. Mm-hmm. I know yeah. you've been playing it at the game stage. Yeah. So can you tell everyone how far you've got with the Far East Handbook? Pretty much all laid out. I'm just in the process of, I just undercoated some vehicles today before I left because I'm, I'm painting up some of those little pictures and little vignettes that will be uh, going in the book. So we're literally at that point where I'm doing that. I've just a tiny bit of layout left, um, but it's, no, it's pretty much all done. Pretty much all done. I hope 
and it's my plan next week to spend the whole week working on that and get that completed. That um, will be great. Right? It, it will be great. Um, I've had such a great time mm. doing the Far Eastern Pacific handbook, and, uh, but, but it, I'm getting to the point now where I keep finding new books and in <laughs> striving for perfection, I keep reading new books. Yeah. But of course, as Nick always says to me, perfection yeah. is the enemy of, of good. Yeah. And so uh, I know what I've done has been heavily researched to say the least. So it's ready. That is fantastic news. I mean, it is that thing that there's always something more you can find out or read, and yeah. that does tend to be there. an enemy once you get to one point. But yeah, yeah. You, you get to the point where you read another book mm. and you've you know you spent six hundred <coughs> pages of mm. reading what you already know, and you think yeah. actually there's not a lot more now available that I can find out. Unless I were to do some primary research and you know do a doctorate in this and spend weeks and weeks and weeks in the archives. Well, that's absolutely right. And I've got to the point now where I'm starting to reread things that I read two, three years ago, yeah. thinking, did I miss anything? And of yeah. course, I, I haven't missed anything. So it's just it's turning into a bit of an obsession, and I've got to stop that because uh, I know what I've produced is really good, and I and I'm really pleased with it. And uh, I have you know, a lot of help from people on the way, like Len down in the. Australia, so really keen to get that over the try line. That would be that would be fantastic when it's done because there's other things which are knocking on the door, such as Midgard, and I know that's mm. something that we've seen at the Lardy Game Stands. It's it's James mm. Morris's uh, rule set, which I think is a bit of a toolbox mm. for fantasy uh, war mm. games, but also mm. uh, could be used for Dark Age and perhaps medieval yep. and ancient uh, war gaming as well. Um, Other um, way around, really, mate. It's, ah. it's more of a more of a early medieval, as uh, as people like to call it now. Dark Ages is, uh, is the term that I prefer, but I understand academically early medieval is what people prefer. But it's it's uh, very much for that. But it allows you then to take that into the world of fantasy and magic and uh, weird and wonderful creatures. So, but very much that toolbox that allows you to build your armies to suit whatever you want to do. So, if you want to do Tolkien, you can. If you want to do Narnia, you can. If you want to do um, uh, the legends of King Arthur, you can. If you want to do um, you know, Irish legends, uh, you can. So, uh, yeah, great fun. That, uh, James and I had a, a third or fourth editorial meeting yesterday, and uh, I've sent him away with a little bit of work to do on it. But that, within days, is going to be at the point where it's going to be going. We've stripped it down to the key text, because what we do is when we get a document, we deconstruct it and then we reconstruct it. Um, and that is then going to be going out to the playtest group so that people can check the text, make sure it's right. It's one of those things where James had produced a great set of playtest rules with all the diagrams in, which are fabulously helpful and lots of pretty pictures. But it's important that we make sure we've got the text absolutely right. So that's what we've been working on. Once we've got that and the people have said, yeah, it's all in here, we're playing it, and it plays really well, and we, and we understand it, and it's clear, then we can add all those illustrations back in. So it's really super clear and very pretty. And we've been working with uh, Handiwork Games, John Hudson, and uh, Handiwork Games, who are who've just done, uh, they're running at the moment, a Kickstarter for fabulous, beautiful uh, background fantasy and sci-fi settings for you to use this uh, great book and photograph your figures up against it, which looks great. They're doing all the layout and artwork for us, so we're really going to town on this, and it's going to look fabulous. Yeah, John Hodgson, Hollywood mm. Games, mm. James Morris, definitely the gentleman of the moment. I mean, that's mm. a really great combination there, and I'm sure that'll be really, really popular. But it's not just new things that you're doing. We thought you've also been working on... Um, uh, a, a re-edition of a much-loved game, General Dalmay, and I think that yeah, that's edition. about to be edited now. Oh, that's about to go for editing, yeah, absolutely. What I've said to Dave is, right, um, Midgard's at the point now where it's going to go back to the playtest group. I'm going to have a week on the Far East to get that completed, and then after that we're going on to, to do exactly the same thing with General Dalmay too. We're going to deconstruct it, reconstruct it, and then do the layout on that. So, yeah, there's so much happening. Um, and it's, it's, it's inspiring, actually really inspiring to, um, to see all these great new products lining up. And some existing products doing really, really well. I mean, one of the things that uh, I took away from Eacham mm. and also from Muscleborough mm. was just how popular 
uh, what a cowboy is. I'm not just blowing smoke, but I mean, genuinely, mm. people are very enthused. And a, and a shout out to Michael mm. Gray up in Scotland, mm. who has been um, in his dedication to the game, to the Texas, mm. Mexico book, to find examples of Mexican villages, which he's photographed. And then he's produced some beautiful um, PDF Mexican houses, which are quite small. You might remember his very small church and oratory from yeah, I do. Uh, a few years yeah. ago. Michael's a really talented mm. artist um, and builder of MDF mm. buildings. And uh, Walter Cowboy is going down great guns in Scotland and also at Evesham. Mm. So that must be good news to you and John Savage's bank account. Mm. Did, you, did he go down to the West Texas town of El Paso, do you know? I don't know mm. precisely where Michael mm. went, but he's got I, I a lot know, of photos. I know a song about that. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what a cowboy is flying out the door. I had a, <clears throat> I had a call from a couple of distributors just before I went away on holiday saying, can we have more what a cowboys, please? And then I said, oh, I'm just about to go away on holiday. I'll come up the day I get back. And before I got back, they said, no, we need more than we thought. And when I got there, I said, I've got them. And they said, oh, no, that isn't enough. <laughs> so uh, it's great to see how it's flying out the door, which is um, really, really positive. It's yeah, been fantastic to see the photos of people, you know, the cowboy figures that people are coming up with, the names that they're coming up with oh. as well, most of which are libelous. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but, um, well, not for polite companies. No, but, you know, yeah. I've seen loads of photos of people having really good fun with some games. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, Rich, mm -hmm. um, ugly as seeing Jim with a bag on his head, seems to have started a bit of a movement. There's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a run of figures with bags on their head. I saw a game online the other day. Yeah, so they all had bags. bags on their head. I know, I know. Ugly as seeing Jim is obviously a bit of a trendsetter, really. <laughs> Uh, I don't know whether they have severe facial damage or whether they just go for the bag look. Just, I suppose it's easier to paint, isn't it, a bag look? Yeah. <laughs> well, the things Most of my figures look like that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, the things you start when you start messing around with cutting off heads and doing uh, conversions, uh, which very <laughs> much... Heads you cut off it. I've cut a few in my time, I have to this say. Happened, the French Revolution, cut off all those heads. <laughs> what a thing they started with that. Yeah. Well, at that point, We'd normally stroll to the workshop to look at our head conversions, yeah. um, but that's many miles away from where we are sitting at this moment. So let's take as is the rest of the house. As is, as is the rest of the house. Uh, as, so let's take a metaphorical trip there and relax in the sun while I ask, "What have you both been working on?" So Nick, I'm going to start with you. I've been down at the harbour side making my dockyard scene. We said about it for Evesham. Um, I've been having great fun with that, enjoying making uh, you know a kind of a, a fairly standard old French town that might have a bit of a military depot in it mm. and building that up on the on the styro board so things like lighthouses factory units barbed wire fencing uh, railway shunting yards that kind of stuff just real mix match of things and actually I'm really excited by it because I can you know because it's modular in terms of the, the styrofoam making the the old Stone Harbour area. You can mix that up as much as you like. So I can have different different layouts of, of harbour as much as I want to, with you know an industrial zone or mm. an urban mm. zone or a you know it's just been really good fun to do it and and searching online. I'm a bit of a I, I like searching out unusual things. So looking for well looking for boat models. Yeah, right. <laughs> looking, looking for you know looking for boat models in one forty eight or one fiftieth anything. Anything mm. with boats up to about 160th scale is probably okay. Uh, so I, you know, I've, I'm still awaiting uh, delivery of some that I've ordered online, mm. um, which will give up a really nice sort of German, um, what's like an armed trawler, which, is, which would oh, be lovely. fantastic in that. And you could use that Pegasus Bridge as well or something like that, couldn't you? They had an armed trawler yeah, you probably choked could. up the yeah. river there <laughs> and opened fire on them. And... Well, the other thing called through the dockyard <clears> is... Uh, mm. no, of course, it's actually really good for sharp practice as well. Yeah. Because well, I've got my uh, Royal, I've got my Marines and my sailing ships and HMS mm -hmm. Chlamydia and all that. Yeah. All I've got to do is, is make that dockyard Napoleonic. Yeah. In its, you know, take the factories out, take, take the railway right. yards out. Yeah. And uh, it could look fantastic for a game around that as well. Okay. So we could do, you know, keep it on by. Anyway, any kind of uh, daring mission in sharp practice would go really nicely yeah. with that. Bridging. And imagine how fantastic it would look as well with the boats on the quayside. Okay. Yeah, it'd be good that. So that, I'm really excited by that, and that's tr be truthful. That's been pretty much my focus. One thing I have managed to achieve is I finally built the war bases, Prussian manor house. Is it called the Prussian manor? The, the point you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had it. For, I had it for a long, 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 long time. 
And Glen at Warbase, he's always ribs me about it. But I finally built it. I haven't finished it yet, but it is now constructed. I've built it, but I haven't finished it, right. And, and so I, you well, haven't built it. No, no, I, but You've I built started it. Building. Yeah, no, I built it. And do you know what? I'm really <laughs> pleased with myself because I built it in about 40 minutes mm. without reference mm. to the instructions mm -hmm. with super glue. First time <laughs> round, yeah. bish, bosh, dosh, yeah. done. And I'm so proud of myself for that. And, uh, you know, there was one bit where I thought I got it horribly wrong and I was going to have to take the super glue bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I had got it right. So that was it. That's me, really. I've not done much else apart from that. That's a fair chunk of stuff. Well, Rich, uh, in addition to eating Greek salads and yeah, yeah. enjoying books by Paul, what have you been up to? I've done a lot, really. But um, I, I've been I've been getting a lot of three three D odds and ends printed mm. um, to create some of the artwork for the Far East Handbook. So it's all things like uh, I've got a little Japanese reconnaissance car and I did a vignette with a, a little communication team and a radio set and a bloke pointing as if to say, here come the bad guys. Um, and uh, I've, I've done a few um, sort of Indian troops with mules for some of the units after the motorised period. And all sorts of one-off pieces, which is quite fun, really. Mm. I find if I'm painting half a dozen Shermans at the same time, it's really quick, really time effective because mm. you you create a, a production line system uh, and you can't do that when you're doing one-off buildings but it's also quite fun to do what one-off vehicles it's also probably more fun to do one-off vehicles because you don't get bored of it yeah i like them i was doing my crease marine for the commandos yeah. and i did a couple of vignettes and what they're mm. what they're really good at is if you're painting you know 30 40 figures of the same yeah. You know that the vignette is going to come around for you to do that yeah. bit of blue on it, and you kind of so I kind of you know you can do ten figures, then you get yeah. an exciting vignette to do something different, which is then different, you do another yeah. ten, then you get another vignette. Mm. So it just makes it a bit more interesting, yeah. a bit less boring. When Variety you is the spice of life, mm. isn't, isn't it? Just, just, yeah. yeah. So, but what I did buy, which I'm really keen, at this, uh, uh, it's on my desk, and when I arrived back, I had oh, all the accounts have arrived for the end of the year <laughs> and whatever. So I haven't had it, but I'm looking at this. I bought a sprue. On eBay, a single sprue of um, Boxer Rebellion Chinese figures, which I'm not going to do the Boxer Rebellion, although I would actually love to do the Boxer Rebellion, but I'm not doing the Boxer Rebellion. What I'm doing, these plastic figures, I'm going to combine in a Frankenstein monster type way with Great Escape Games Gunfighter arms. And so I'm going to have, remember David Carradine in Kung Fu? Yeah. Who and you had all, yeah, well, exactly. Who doesn't? Is anybody under 50? But never mind. <laughs> um, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these Chinese figures with um, gunfighter shotguns and pistols and yeah. dynamite and whatever. And they're going to be like the gangs of guys on the railway, working on the railway, who got fed up of being doing everybody's washing yeah. and being put down and decided to live a life of crime. So I'm going to have my own little Chinese triad gang on for the Wild West. That'd be That's going to be great with all the pigtails and the, the you know, the, uh, the uh, lampshade hats and all that. Probably not allowed to say that anymore, but never mind. No, really, but that, yeah, that will be <laughs> fun. He's always said something different like that. It's going to be something really yeah, different. Yeah, I, I can't it? dread to think what some of the... Yeah, uh, and some of the names. Scenario, I'm really very careful to keep them appropriate. That's all I can say about yeah. very modern men. Yeah. We'll create the gang, okay? Yeah, it would be. Well, actually, yeah, yeah, it would be great. And you could have a Kung Fu artist doing Kung Fu. Oh. Walking the rice paper, maybe. A vignette of somebody walking the rice paper. He, is he from Hong Kong? No. <laughs> No, I'm not going there. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going there. You're going to have Sarge and Rosemary as well. No, I'm not going to have Hong Kong food and Sarge. And Rosemary, Rosemary, the telegraph operator. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to be getting any mild mannered janitors, no. Are you sure? Yeah. Could be. Uh, oh, very good. It is tempting. It is tempting. Listen, your role is a straight man. Don't forget it. <laughs> I was out of my box there for a moment. Uh, but that sounds fantastic. Right. Well, and I've been... It's, it's going to be fun. And that's the thing with plastic figures. Yeah. It's a mishmash. You I mean, love it. I love that. Yeah. I mean, so, again, with my cream Marine, I really enjoyed chopping yeah. some metal arms off, putting plastic ones on, yeah. holding a beer bottle. But yeah. it's, it's good fun to do that. Yeah. For, uh, variety is the spice of life, I think. Mm. Yeah. Certainly doing things like that is great fun. Well, I, I, want to do, I want to do a little vignette for the Coca-Cola track with one of my Australians bowling a number 36 Mills bomb. 
a la in the style of you know, Shane Warne or something like that. And uh, <laughs> well, Mitchell Stark. We yeah, thought. that's Shane well. Warren. Let's not even go there. Mate. But they, um, <laughs> today's a big day. Uh, today's a big day in the second test. So we'll see what will happen. But, it is. Well, I'm uh, not looking at the score at the minute. I'm no, I'm not worse. looking at the score. I don't want to know actually. But. Anyway, I've been uh, talking to Brian to bit of spice of life. I've been plugging away with my samurai and doing the terrain for Lard Workshop in August. Um, is this for Bond's Art Bond? This basically. is when the last sword is drawn. That's right. What's going to be different about this terrain? This, this terrain is, is going to be different because it's winter terrain. And I've never no, done winter no, terrain before. No. And I've always wanted to do it. But what I have found is that it's not just enough to do the ground. You've got to have winter trees and winter bushes and yeah. winter yeah. figures oh. and all that sort of stuff. Fantastic. What about the winter sumo man? Is he going to be there? Um, there will be a winter version of the same character. Is he going to be... Doing the same thing in the, in the garden. He's got a different pose. He will, but it'll be yeah. frozen solid. The Rikishi, <laughs> the Rikishi has a different pose. So that's been great fun. I've really enjoyed it. What's, what's different that. about him in the winter then? What will be different about him? He's wearing a robe. Oh, he's put something in his robe. Yeah, it's still a large what character. What kind of though? satin was it? It's a kimono. Oh, of course. Oh, it's it's great. Great. So that, that it, will be. Is it a model gone wrong, Jeremy? or? So we've got a frozen pond oh. rather than a Ooh. frozen pond. How do you know it's frozen? What's the difference? Uh, I've put some in the uh, the resin. I've right. put something which is crackling and some oh. little bits of some tiny little white bits Very of snow in there. So the penguins. Like the penguins. <laughs> oh, there's no penguins. There's no penguins in Japan. So that's been great fun. I've really enjoyed doing that. And I've also, um, uh, just a little diversion, I found some 4,800 4, Napoleonic ships. And I just painted those up and they didn't, they took merely a day and I did some small islands with that. And I've just forgotten how much fun it is to just produce something rinky which dinky, is completely different. They're yeah, really, they're really rinky dinky. Very small. I had some a while ago, which I think were 2,400. Yeah. So these are really lovely. So these are about, I'm holding it in my hand, dear listener. It's an inch. The, ba uh, the yeah, base is the base an inch is long. But the ship on the base <coughs> is the size of a cufflink. Yeah, it's about the size of a cuff thing. They're from tumbling dice. Uh, one <laughs> is that a unit of measurement? It? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's one yeah, cuff thing yeah, in yeah, size. Yeah, um, uh, but the nice thing about these is that they come as a one piece casting, so there's no yeah, fitting around yeah, the mass. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And they're yeah. very robust. They're they, metal, yeah. They're metal, they're made out of a good quality metal. And can I try and break it? No, please don't. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they are very robust. So, can you tell? I'm looking at it now. You can, I'm not sure if I, what is a two decker. Or a three decker. No. That's a that's a brick. That's a two mast. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. There's a scooter yeah. in there as well. I've done them all as I've done them all really as three. That one's a bit longer. That one's a bit longer. But the scale, the, the, the terrain you can do with the group of little islands there, which I made up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What did you make them from? Uh, a ship wreck That's just well. styrofoam and just a bit of offcut of styrofoam and no. some clump foliage. Clump foliage which you soaked in PVA. Yeah, I soaked in PVA and put on the top. So it actually looks about the size of a large cufflink, if we're going to yeah. go with the fact <laughs> that cufflinks are a unit of measurement. A large or cufflink. It's actually about the size of a penny, a one piece. Yeah, it looks yeah. like yeah. A, <clears throat> a new potato cut in half. It does. That's gone mouldy. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, a the sea. there's a Caribbean island, the giant floating there. turnip. Yeah. And, and see, there's one here which is a dismasted sea. Yeah, that's dismasted. That's a damaged ship. Oh, okay. So that can mm. be uh, a ship which. Who makes them? Mate? Who makes tumbling them? dice? Tumbling dice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We like tumbling dice. They produce yeah. some great nice, stuff, nice, mate. Nice. Really, really Aeroplanes nice. I really nice. enjoyed doing those. So that was my uh, contribution to what we've been doing. Um, but. What have we got as the best bit on the bench? I mean, I would actually put these, I mean, I know they're not new, but these tumbling dice ships are just delightful. And I would say that they are my best bit on the bench, or one of them, I've got another, um, for the uh, last month or so. But Nick, you they're very nice. Well, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, it's a bit boring, maybe, mm. but it's absolutely versatile as anything. Mm. That styrofoam, is it called styrofoam? You know, mm, the yeah, kind of yeah. grey polystyrene. <coughs> High density polystyrene it's sheets. Yeah. Brilliant. So I've used yeah, it on the good. command. I've used it for the key side. Mm. It comes in a in a in a slab of kind of four by four foot by two foot. Depends what size perfect. you order it in, mate. <laughs> <laughs> if you order it in that size, it arrives, yeah, it arrives in that size. Um, but then, of course, you can cut it, and, it, and it's brilliant. I've used it for, um, I've used it for the harbour. I've used it for sort of steps. Mm. I've used it for um, uh, cutting sort of you know support strips that go underneath bridges. I've cut it for uh, just you, mm. you know it's so versatile. It's very with a hot wire cutter. Yeah, yeah. I've made a bunker, a little machine gun bunker that goes yeah. on the side of the harbour out of it. 
you know, it's just fun. And, and it's, it's quick, fun. isn't it? And with really a hot pin, quick. With a hot, whatever mm. it's called, a hot pen thingy. Yeah, engraving. Um, you know, I just, yeah. I just did the stonework, just engraved it. I just drew lots of... Sort I, of I was amazed like at that. that because what I had normally done in the past when I've used that, like, if you remember, I did a game set in, uh, uh, in Kowloon in the New Territories and I used the styrofoam. But what I did is I took the, the one and a half inch thick, maybe two inches, maybe one inch, I can't remember, styrofoam to, to make the docks. Yeah. And I faced that with a stone stuff, right. the plastic sheets from Wills. Yeah, I yeah. didn't need to do that. You just took the, the, the styrofoam sheet and engraved it. It, it, it took a little thing. while to sit there, you know, to, to, yeah, to but draw it out. Yeah, it costs nothing, does it? It costs nothing. It's quite good fun. I quite enjoyed it. And, and it, the effect was just as good as my... You know, more much more expensive options. So, yeah. so I, was, I was impressed with the way that works. It's a really ubiquitous <coughs> piece of material that you know you can just make buildings out of it. It's great for obviously making terrain. Mm. If you know you want to build undulations or go create recesses, hills, or rivers. Yeah. But terrain boards. Um, mm. Terrain boards have previously been something I've kind of not had much time for because mm. I thought the effort involved was too much. Mm. But if it were it not for the storage. Issues. I think mm. I would use them a lot more and make my own. Yeah, game. yeah. There, there is. Um, it's funny how we go around in cycles, isn't it? I started off gaming with uh, sheet green coloured subutio cloth mm. over yeah. over things on the table that created the hills. Yeah. And then five years later, everybody's going, "Cool, you can't do that. That's ridiculous. You know, stupid." And now we've gone back to beautiful cloths mm. like Geek Villain and, the, and you know, the, the other guys who are out there selling yeah. their products yeah. with stuff underneath to create the hills. And we, right, yeah. We've almost gone around a full circle. And those terrain, if you remember, when I had my War Games table built about uh, 25 years, maybe nearly 25 years ago, just over, um, I got those TSS two-foot square polystyrene mm. terrain boards. And now the idea of terrain... Yeah. And, and, they went out of fashion and I got rid of them. Mm. Now the idea, it's quite attractive, isn't it? Mm. Having those boards, because you right. can do things like sunken roads. Yeah. It's very difficult to create a sunken mm. road in, in, in another, another medium. You have to represent it in other ways. Anyway, I, my best bit on the bench is definitely the um, plastic, <laughs> um, plastic Chinese blokes, because I'm really, really excited about it. But I, I would accept the fact I'm not going to win with that. And to be honest with you, that's largely because I've been so busy working on on other projects. I haven't really had an opportunity to do much on the workbench. Your so. little ships are really impressive mm. there. Since you do a nice big. I built some roads out of out of MDF, yeah, yeah, like yeah, nine yeah. mil MDF. Built some uh, roads for Burma, mm. which are slightly raised to go through the terrains nice. of the paddy like, fields, like and like those. they work really well. But that's, again, that's that's a sheet of nine mil MDF. I'm not putting forward that nine mil MDF is the best bit on the bench. No, I do have another <coughs> bit on the bench, which actually was given to me by Derek Hodge up in Musselburgh, and mm. I think this is actually going to be a winner. Um, I didn't bring them down actually. We'll they're see in, you now. They're mm. in the house, so mm. I'm not going to go all the way to get those. But they are decals, mm. uh, water slide decals, which Derek does through his page, which I think is Derek's Wee Toys. Mm. Um, uh, and these are wonderful. <coughs> so Derek prints these decals, mm. and he, I got them for samurai sashimono banners. But Derek does a lot of different decals for different flags, and they are absolutely fantastic. I've, I've got a few of them on a sashimono, um, and Derek printed me off some from the Honda clan, the Meiyui, and the Hiki Ryo clan, and they're all really good. So I got them small, but Derek can um, increase them, in, <laughs> yeah. root them up and increase yeah. them into a large size. Size and yeah, you know, Derek's obviously a one man band, but it's a really great little venture that he's got on the side there. So I'd probably put those mm. forward as being the best fit on the bench. We like to support mm. small producers, oh, we absolutely yeah. do like yeah, to support yeah, yeah, small yeah. producers. And yeah. if I'm going to vote for somebody, is it going to be We Derek up in Scotland, or is it going to be Home Base or, <laughs> <laughs> or B&Q yeah. Yeah, down yeah, here? Yeah. I'm going to vote for We Derek every time because we're on the side of the small man, yeah, not well, the I'll Derek agree small. Um, I'll have to have a look at that. So can you, has he got like a catalogue, Sid? Or you he just, has a um, catalogue basically right? on the website. So he goes to the website, you yeah. find what you want, you email him mm. and he will print that off and send it. Thanks. Yeah. We could put so, that in the show notes if we ever did show ever notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's say they're in the show notes. And leave <laughs> then we'll pretend they're that. Yeah. <laughs> if we have show notes, or you could we Google Derek's wee toys and you could probably find it from that, could you? So, yes, yeah. So Why don't you do it now? What are they? These... 
I don't see transfers. I don't mate. Know, we've got the internet in this part of the house. No. <laughs> we do have internet. So yeah. they're transfers, so these are water. Are they're they water, water slide transfers. Water slide. So that, I've got them printed out only a couple of millimetres across, so they fit on mm. a very small 28 millimetre banner. But Derek can blow them up with, um, yeah, and mm. you can print them off. Uh, he can print them off and send them mm. to you. So you can have them up to about the size of a penny, maybe even up to two pence a piece. <laughs> but there's different um, uh, transfers. Fantasy, some of World War Two, there's Randalls. Mm. Right, Derek's one. Derek, let's get on. I'm fed up talking <laughs> about them. Okay, well, I think at that point we probably have time. <laughs> for a T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll get a T-shirt from Jeff to Derek, <laughs> and we'll have time for a jingle. Sydney Roundwood. He's got red trousers. Sydney Roundwood sofa of sincerity. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we've wrapped up the workshop, and that leaves us, after that jingle, plenty of time to talk about the big issue for this show. And we're going to talk about dice. Uh, and this was prompted by a discussion on the internet, which I know, Richard, you chipped in on briefly, uh, all about the role of dice in war games. And I think for most of us, having dice in a game is simply the norm that we've accepted from the time that we began playing games as children. So snakes and ladders or shoots and snakes, or whatever the Americans call it, uh, was probably the first introduction many of us got to dice. That said, we know from various conversations online um, that you chaps have had that some serious war games in military circles do away with dice entirely. And there were several mm -hmm. schools of dice proponents uh, that we're familiar with who stick doggedly to the D6, um, but also lovers of more funky dice like D10 or D12 or D4s even. Um, some games have buckets of dice. Mm. Some games just use the one dice or a pair of percentage dice. So I thought it would be a, quite a good topic for a big issue to discuss dice in war games and taking it back to the very beginning, asking what's the purpose of dice in a war game chat? Hmm, it's really interesting, that, isn't it? It's just something I've noticed actually from the and the ops rooms chats we had from mm. some serious gamers, and I know mm. from I know from using serious games in sort of corporate spaces, you know, this kind of dice is, is one of those things that people do feel quite strongly about. It very strongly connects what you're doing to a game, uh, and you know, we, as you say, Steve, we've we've grown up with dice. Dice suggest gaming, and gaming is a fun thing to do, uh, and some sometimes can be viewed as being non-serious by some people. But I think gaming dice is very much at the heart of. of what we always do. I can't really imagine myself playing a war game that didn't have dice in it, really. I have done, and it felt like a war game with all fun surgically mm. removed. Mm. <laughs> it was it's a computer. Roll the dice, isn't yes, it? that's right. It's a computer given, driven game, and they say, well, What's your unit firing? You go, It's unit number 19. And who's it firing on? It's firing on the uh, unit number, yes, so unit number, number 62. And they go, Right, and what's the range? And you go, Bleh. and then they go, okay. And you think, I just, I, at this moment, I, my arm is physically yeah, going, yeah. roll the dice, roll the dice, roll the dice. But all the computer and is doing is rolling, is, is rolling the dice. All the computer is doing is rolling the dice. Yeah. And you can't see it. Now, there is something about that that's interesting because maybe the computer program could give you a report that says, you see the unit. Um, stagger under the fire and then move forward again yeah, yeah, yeah. and you have to decide well to what degree did that affect it if, yeah. if the computer game could give you that kind of report so you wouldn't know i've lost precisely three figures out of 24 that could be an opportunity but what i did find was it took forever to program yeah. unit 18 firing at unit 62. But that, of course, is what we do do often in a Kriegspiel, where you, where you roll a dice that a player doesn't see. And then you would say to them, you see the unit yes. first, but they still come on. Yes. So you put yourself in that kind of computer space in that, in that situation. And, and in that situation, you're not taking ages to type it in. No. You're doing what Paddy Griffiths taught us to do. So what is the, what is the minimum effect? What is the maximum effect? Mm -hmm. That then gives you a spread of potential results mm -hmm. with the minimum effect being one, the maximum effect being six. Mm -hmm. Let's roll the dice. Yeah. And that's a decision that I always come back to. It's like making a putt in golf. You get golfers who lie down on the floor, line it up with their golf bat, um, doing all that stuff, looking at this, that, and the other. And they say university clever people say you don't need to do that your brain is already making that calculation as you walk up yeah, absolutely. so address the ball 
play it and you're better off rather than making all those calculations which actually go against the calculations that your brain has already made. Yeah. So we know that in a war game situation, we roll that dice, we present that decision. It doesn't take the time necessary to do that input. I find with professional military people in war gaming that their objection to dice is based on the belief that a dice will give you such a span of results that it would become absurd from zero to a million. When in fact, that isn't the case, but they assume that the spread is so wide. And you think that's the main reason why organisations shy away from the use of dice? No, I think it's because it it signifies it as a game. As a game. They're scared. It's, it's they're scared of what they're post. doing being seen as a game. But they're also scared of being presented with a result that they hadn't anticipated. Because <laughs> they believe that as professionals, they should be able to anticipate what could happen. Therefore, if you said to them, what are the likely outcomes of this situation? They would probably choose the dice results that we would call two, three, four, and five. They would never factor in the one or the six, the extremes, because that wouldn't fit with their way of thinking. They would always err on the median result. Whereas in reality, extreme results happen all the time. And if you take out those extreme results, you take away the command challenges where you have to respond to extreme situations. But the thing there about the one and the six being extreme, of course, yeah. you know, on a, on a one D six, they're not extreme, right? Mm. So yeah. let, let, we, we, we need to come back to that. But yeah. this idea that people roll a dice to get their outcome and, and mm. what it creates for them, what it means for them is important. Um, if, you're, if you're playing a game and you roll a dice and you roll a six, you kind of expect that you're going to get the best outcome you can. Yeah. So we have this expectation also within the scores of dice that actually high is a good thing mm. in, for the person who's rolling and low is a, is a bad thing. So I think we need to be careful of that because sometimes when you ask somebody to roll a dice and roll a six, you know, they instantly assume that that's going to be the best outcome they could have got. We're actually, we just need to be smart about that because it doesn't always have to be like that. No. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you both, you both clearly feel that dice enhance the war game. So I thought one of the things that we could do is drill down a little bit and think about the way that dice can be used um, and as we've both mentioned, or all three of us mentioned before, there's lots of different dice which can be used in a game and lots of different ways we could do that. Now, I thought I was going to make some flashcards and hold up the different ways that dice can be used, but I didn't do that. So let's just work our way through the list. So the first question would be, when is the ideal time uh, in a game to use just one single dice to get a result? Nicholas, do you want to go? Um, well, when you're using one single dice, you're going to get if it's a, a so, okay if it's a d6, right? You're going to get one of six potential outcomes, each one of which has an equal probability of yeah. occurring. Okay, so and sometimes you say, "Oh, well, I'm going to roll a d10." Well, all you're doing then is saying you get ten possible outcomes with the same, you know, with you're going to get a ten percent chance of each one happening. There's no kind of scalability in that. No. There's no, there's no. It's it's fairly. Um, Crude. So if every outcome that is possible is equally likely, then yeah. using a single dice is the best way to do it. Now yeah. I'll give you an example of that. If, you, if, if my troops are moving forward tactically in chain of command, it is entirely predictable that they will move between one and six inches. But we don't know exactly what they will do because I'm, I'm, you are saying to them, move forward, allowing and taking into account the tactical circumstances. Now, they might be very wary and only go forward one inch, or they might look, take, in, uh, take into consideration all the situations, all the circumstances that they can see, and then go forward six inches. Mm. But that is that is predictable within, within the bounds of that. But equal, every result in there is equally likely. Mm. And, and I think that's right for a unit that is moving in, in a tactical sense, it's just as likely to, to go very slowly as it is just as likely to go relatively quickly. Mm. And when would a single dice not do the job? When you have any, when you want to get any variability in terms of the likelihood of the outcome. So mm. I played, uh, I can't remember the name, I honestly can't remember the name of the rules. If I could, I probably wouldn't mention them. Uh, but I played an American Civil War game with a friend, and what happened was when you activated units, you rolled a D10, and that determined how that unit would then respond to those orders. 
So if you were saying march forward, if you rolled a one, uh, the unit would go, oh, I'm not going anywhere. They'd go hesitant and they'd stand still and they'd redress the ranks. But if you rolled a 10, they'd be hugely enthusiastic and they'd go forward, you know, double normal move. Uh, and if you rolled a five, they'd do a pretty normal average, average move. Now, the issue with that for me is that every outcome there, it's just as likely that the unit will do a normal move as it will do a not move at all, or as it will become hugely enthusiastic. Yeah, the risk is that luck becomes too it's large a factor. That, that using that one dice means the outcome is entirely based on luck. And that starts us out on our journey about using multiple dice. So mm. when would you use just two dice? Okay, let me carry on the same example. Now, if I was playing that American Civil War game where there were 10 possible outcomes, why don't I do a spinal tap and turn that up to 11 possible outcomes, just add an extra one on the top, and roll 2d6? Because then what you get is that not all outcomes are created equally. Um, you, if you are rolling uh, 2d6, the chance of you getting an outcome of 2, uh, you know, double 1, is only, well, it's under 3%. Whereas the chances of you rolling a 7 is approaching 20%. And actually, if you extend that and say, the chances of you rolling a six, a seven, or an eight is about 50%. So the chance of getting a medium average result is about 50%. The chance of getting an extreme result, that unit goes mad and surges forward, firing all its guns across them, explode into space, um, or doing absolutely nothing, there's only a 3% chance or under 3% chance of those things happen. So using 2d6 creates a bell curve. Mm. Uh, and the important yeah. thing about a bell curve is not just the likelihood of the single result you're looking at. It's the likelihood of the result being grouped somewhere in that area. Yeah. So you have what are called quartiles. There are four quartiles of result. The lower quartile are the most unlikely results. The central two quartiles are the most likely result, and the upper quartile just mirrors the, the lower quartile. So it gives you a bell curve where the, a normal result is most likely to happen. An extreme result is exactly that. It's extreme. And if you take that up to 3d6, you know, the chances of rolling a 3 on 3d6 is less than half a percent. Like, likewise, the chances of rolling a 12. On 3d6 is less than half a percent. So uh, an 18, I mean. Uh, an 18, not 12. Yeah, absolutely right. So an 18, not 12. Um, it just means that extremes become extreme. So, um, so I would say that a good time to um, use multiple dice is when you want the average result to be most prevalent and extreme results to be the just that. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes yeah. Yeah, when you and, and what would happen then if you're not using two dice or three dice, um, but you also don't want to use just one dice, using more dice. You know, whether the situations that one, two, or three dice are not the right tools for the job. What would be? Why would you be using five or six dice? Because obviously you could add up all those different <laughs> dice and get to a number, but that's not often done, is it? I can't remember. A rule set where if somebody was rolling six dice and adding all those numbers together. No, you tend not to find that. Where you, where you tend to find multiple, multiple dice. Now let's call it. Let's let's address the elephant in the room and call it buckets of dice. Where you tend <laughs> to, get, to avoid that. Yeah, where you, where you tend to get buckets of dice. You know, large number of dice being rolled is normally with things like firing, um, where each dice maybe you get ten men firing, so you roll ten dice. Then, mm. Yeah, each dice is representing something, isn't it? Something about the volume of activity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I think if you were to poll our listeners, mm. you'd find people quite enjoy rolling large buckets of dice. On on average, if we roll the dice about what dice people like, I think uh, in the middle there you get some people liking that. But it's the, mm. it's because it enables you to um, to put get different volume of outcome. If that makes sense. Mm. You can, you know, you're not just getting one hit, two hits. You're able to actually make it what's, bigger in comparison to what's what happens happening. is that when the more dice you you roll, the more likely those dice are to give you a result that is statistically and average, uh, average and yeah. probable. Yeah. However, 
when we're rolling a hand of dice in a war game, even if it's a bucket of dice, even if it's 24 dice, let's say you're rolling 24 dice where you need fives and sixes, then you should be getting a result of eight every time. Yeah. But you don't, you because, because the sample, to use a technical mathematical <laughs> term, is not large enough. If you rolled 100 dice, yeah. you probably would find that one third of them were five and six, or very, very close to one third of them were five and six. But when you, even when you're rolling 24 dice, you may well find that you roll 16 fives and sixes, which is, mm. in terms of probability, is the maths tells us is unlikely, but we still see it happen. Mm. Or you could roll 24 dice and go and you get two fives and sixes. Mm. And in wargaming terms, those moments are always the moments that the biggest groan or the biggest yeah. ooh, because when you're rolling in a disproportionately unstatistical yeah. results, that's either good or bad because you've got a general idea of your theater. exact well, It's yes. drama, it's tension. I've got this hand of dice, my opponent's going to roll the same number of dice. So it's prob probability tells us we're going to get the same result. We're both running 24 dice, but you won't. Yeah. <laughs> you won't. And it's the uncertainty, it's what, what it's modelling is the uncertainty. You're going to get, the more you go, the closer you get to an average outcome, but actually it's the ability mm. to create um, disproportionate outcomes mm. that's actually quite interesting. Mm. The ability to reflect the fact that actually that has been a crushing volley. For mm. whatever reason, it's outside the player's control. It's something that's combined to make that volley more effective than the ones you fired mm. previously or something. And that's, yeah, that's kind of reflective of the chaotic nature of the battlefield. And Whereas so, if, if you replace that in the old days, when, when you know, we, we were young and started war game, and when you have percentage dice, you roll a set of percentage dice, the outcome is almost straight line, isn't yeah. it? It's almost like rolling a D10. What yeah. outcome do you get? And it, it, it's I mean, just as likely you get an extreme result as you get now. This is about personal preferences. Yeah, well. of course. Personally, I quite like the idea of percentage dice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, okay, I've got an Eastern chance of a hit, and I roll under 80. And if I roll really, really low in that, maybe I get a really good hit. You know, mm -hmm. And I quite like that mechanism, and it's not one that you see actually these days. No, so much these days. Uh, and I actually hate that mechanism. It's interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but that well, proves the point. Well, because you have two dice in whatever situation, aren't you? Well, you see, I'm not, I don't believe buckets of dice is the answer. I don't believe two dice is the answer. I think the answer is, as a game designer, you create a mechanism which rolls the appropriate number of dice yeah. for those for that particular situation. Stopping you there for a moment, just coming back just a couple of se seconds, mm. when is the bucket of dice appropriate? Not, not appropriate. You said that it wasn't always appropriate. When, when did you think that a bucket of dice, and I'm not talking about 100 dice, maybe no, no. talking about 25 dice, yeah. When is that not appropriate? You don't want to do that all the time because the game would just be, become inert with you wielding buckets of dice. You know, literally, every, if at every decision-making point you had to roll 25 dice and see what results you got, A, it would become vastly more predictable. Mm. Um, you know, imagine you rolled 25 dice for movement and you moved a millimetre for every five and six <laughs> you got, or, or whatever, or a centimetre for down. every five and six you got. It would just be such the most tedious mechanism in the world. But it would mean that you could possibly move nothing or possibly move 10 feet or yeah. whatever the outcome would be. So you, <laughs> you, you, you've got to keep it appropriate, which is why in Chain of Command, to go back to that, if you're moving tactically, you move 1d6. It's completely random because you're taking into account somebody taking a great deal of care. If you move normally, you're going 2d6. And it's not random, it's variable. But it is more predictable. The chances of you rolling that 6, 7 or 8 inches is knocking on for that 50%. So you can predict it. And if you roll 3d6 because you're running... Um, well, the chances of you rolling you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 inches is like 66, 70 percent. And, so, and you're taking it, sorry, Steve, you're taking mm. it as an average for the unit as well. You're not trying to mm. roll one dice per man. <laughs> yeah, which, which again is that you could do that. You could roll one dice per man, and this, this well, man, you know, they would take the average and take that score yeah. away from that one. You could overcomplicate it. It's a way of just keeping it simple. Bonsai bonkers, you roll one dice per man. But the reason you do that when you're activating, the reason you do that. It's a very, very small parlour game type yeah, game, isn't yeah. it? With that, well, a boutique game. What would you call well, it? Cowboy. I, think, um, I think you'd say a boutique game boutique is not game. a bad way yeah. of describing it. Boutique bonsai bonsai. Tabletop game. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Boutique. 
Uh, I, I, one of the things which interests me is that buckets of dice is, is great fun in the right place, as you yes. used to say, Richard. It's the theatre, that moment of It is theatre, and I yeah. think a lot of wargaming, yeah. great wargaming, can be mm. theatre. Mm. I always get a bit disappointed when people use mm. the term buckets of dice disparagingly. Uh, not to be down on the professional wargamers, but I would imagine that the type of games run by the guys in the ops room they wouldn't be using a bucket of yeah, dice. Well, no, but that's only because they're scared that the outdoor... That's only because they're scared... The US Naval War College, you wouldn't bring in 25 dice. Well, you might do, actually. Well, they, the US Naval War College, you but, might. But, they, but they're, just, they're just using a slightly different mechanism to get the same probability distribution and outcome. But they're just not using dice to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the reasons people don't like buckets of dice, I think... Is because people think it's oh, this game becomes totally reliant on what I roll on the dice. You know, it's completely dice. It's, yeah, it's really completely down to luck. You're right, but it isn't because <laughs> because 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 handfuls of dice take the luck out of it and they bring a probability into it, yes. which is which is they right. enhance the probability of getting uh, the expected and anticipated result. They don't make it more random; they make it less random. Yeah. Now, one mechanism which. Uh, I'd like to cover off, which mm. I've really enjoyed um, mm. in your games, is that uh, I think possibly best described as the red dice mechanism, mm. which we saw in the Blitzkrieg 1940 handbook for Chain mm. of Command. Mm. And I know, because obviously we've played it in a sneak preview, that you've got a green dice coming up in the jungle warfare rules in the Far East handbook. So that's the adding of a dice of a unique colour to a hand. Uh, and that dice has its own particular effect. Now, I really like that, uh, and I've been inspired by that, come on to that in a moment, but can you talk, Richard, about how that works in some of your games? I think that's a really innovative um, innovative development. Okay, right, fine. Well, um, Chain of Command, one of the issues we have with Chain of Command is I was never really happy with the way elites worked, and, uh, and I thought, actually, what are we representing here? And we really kind of... Spent a lot of time talking about it, didn't we, Nick, and saying, what are we trying to represent? And we came down to the fact that elite wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't a catch-all term. You know, some units might be die-in-a-ditch brave blokes, but they might have terrible officers. Some units might have fabulous officers, and the troops aren't necessarily that good, but they're inspired by the leadership. So one of the things we thought was, if we're going to rejig this and do something, let's Let's create the red dice. So when you roll your, your hand of five command dice for your unit, you add in a red dice, and then that only has a specific effect. So it kicks in if you roll a one, two, three, or four. If you roll a five or six, it's lost. Um, so it's rolling one distinct dice allows you to amend the hand of dice that you're rolling, but not in an even way. Not every dice is created equally. Some dice have different purposes. So when you fire in, in, a, in a jungle warfare setting, setting, or you can actually apply this to any setting like night fighting where you have variable visibility, you can roll a green dice in the jungle and that will determine, you know, a jungle is, is not a homogenous thing. Um, you, know, you can be in a position where you get a good view of an enemy who thinks he's in great cover. You can be in a position where you can't see the buggers at all. And using a green dice to determine that, it's a bit like in O-Group, where Dave has got in O-Group, when you, if you're firing a target in cover, you, roll, you add a, a, a dice of a, of a different colour for cover, and if you roll a four, five or six, you've actually seen your target, and, if, and therefore you get a reasonable fire effect. But if you roll a one, two or three, you haven't got a great handle on where the enemy is, you're just putting suppressing fire in and, and the result will be reduced. So using that uniquely coloured dice allows us to do slightly different things. But that's just the way we've used it in the games we've got. I know that in Bonsai Bonkers that you've been doing some stuff there where you can add a dice to a hand and it changes the effect of the outcome of the other dice. I, I, I haven't played this, it's only hearing people talking about it. Uh, after after events, tell us what you've done with that, Sid. Yeah, so it, different it, use again, isn't it? Different use again, but inspired very much by what you've been doing. Uh, and this was directly inspired with playing the uh, jungle warfare rules and the green dice, and also uh, the red dice as well. So what we've tried to do, or what we've been trying to do in when the last sword is drawn, uh, not bonds are bonkers. When the last sword is drawn, it's the correct name. But what we're trying to do is create a, an easy a visual sort of cube. So we've got red dice for attack, we've got black dice for defence, but we've also got other dice. So we've got for armour, 
which is subject to attrition. Once armour is used, um, a character will have a number of, uh, if he has armour, he will have a number of armour dice. Or she, mate. Or she. Or she, or she indeed. And they are a resource pool that doesn't refresh, so you put the armour dice into your hand and that can parry an opponent's a hit against you. But mm. once it's used, it's gone. So it adds a different colour. It's white, it's visible, and then that's used. We've also got a dice which we call the blood dice, which you add into your hand if you've got a razor-sharp weapon. Um, not all characters will have a razor-sharp weapon, but if you do, you add a blood dice in, and if that comes up and it's got either, if it's got one face which shows a little symbol of blood, which we've painted on the dice, if that comes up, then that has an effect of commencing a bleeding condition on a character, and that makes hits worse on that character. So it's a way of using dice and uh, in a kind of hopefully an innovative way to vary the results which you, which you're going to have going forward in that particular fight with a character. Mm -hmm. So you've still got the same dice. Um, you know, you've still got the same sort of dice which you're using uh, for the fighting. But you're able to sort of vary the results by adding in different dice. Which it's manipulation. Results. It's manipulation. The word of, I was struggling. Manipulation of, of how I try and defend myself. Manipulation of how I try and uh, do more damage to the enemy. Manipulate a decision making. When when do I defend? When do I attack? That's right. And this is all something that the, the, the players themselves can decide <coughs> upon. So it's really giving the players a choice. Now it's a very small game um, in all sorts of ways, and it's not a super realistic simulation. But it does give the players choices, and the more choices you have within a reasonable extent, you know that helps uh, create an energy within the game itself. It's yeah. also, though, Sid, around smoothing the game mechanics, isn't it? Cool mechanism. Because if you're, you're, what you're doing is you're taking a process that is often, in other rules, a bolt-on process you know, after the one you just rolled for. You're taking that role and putting it into the, the initial hand of dice. So if the blood dice doesn't come up, you don't have to worry about it. Whereas if it does, you then it then means something. Whereas in other rules, that's what you do is you roll for, you, you roll mm. for this, and then you say, okay, and now let's roll, roll again to see, see if there's a, 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 a blood that. dice test. And what you're yeah. doing is you're condensing all those up and actually smoothing the process out while putting it all in one roll, which uh, is you know which is smart. And that's the type of thing that when I saw that, um, I was thinking about a gladiator game where rather than having tests for this, tests for that, you could actually say, right, you have got a limited number of defense dice, which represents your shield. And when you roll that, if you get the right combination of the attacker's dice and the defender's shield dice, maybe that shield is damaged. Maybe you start to lose those dice. Um, and it's more about the management of the hand of dice um, that uh, uh, simplifies a lot of what could be test for this, test for that, test for the other. I think that's right. And we've been working on these sort of mechanisms in a number of different games over the time. And what we're really trying to create, which is the word I'm struggling for, manipulation, but also flow. We're mm. trying to get a good flow in yeah. the game. Yeah. Uh, so what I wanted to try and do is to take the, what you've been doing to try and um, add in historical themes and results, but in a way that the game flows. And using dice, different coloured dice, dice with reduced symbols, dice having particular effects, so it's not that you need to consult a chart to see what that dice does, yeah. but having everything with the dice and not having cards which are then played at yeah. the same time as you're using dice. Mm -hmm. Trying to get the flow right throughout the game and the cards are used for a different purpose within the game. Mm. Dice are your signposts through a game, aren't they? So you go through a process until you reach a dice point mm. and the dice determines where you go next in that journey. Like so, a flowchart. So, like a flowchart. So they determine that you know, the outcome of the game is going to be whatever the outcome is, and the dice are the thing that takes you on that journey there. If you have one dice at the beginning, you roll a you know roll mm. a dice, yeah, one, one you win, and six you lose, then that's a very easy and rapid signpost at the end of the game, isn't it? <laughs> but you but you know as a, as a <laughs> but what we're doing is, is we're using them in cleverer ways at different stages along the way where there are different potential bifurcation points in our journey to say well actually you know because we've got that role it takes us on this one and what the out, what the other thing that means of course is that all journeys then become different. Every time we play a game, because we get a different combination of dice rolls on the way, it takes us on a different pathway to our end journey, which means mm. that no game ever is the same but, and they don't become boring. And or therefore, they do become boring, 
it's because we're getting it wrong. And therefore, are you saying that all dices, uh, all all games with dice, are randomised in their outcome? And no, we can't I don't input think, because on that. Ra- the word random is a, is a, has a particular thing. Mm. It's about predictability of outcomes, which mm. is not the same as being random. Mm. But can we influence? We've had this conversation lots. I know we have. I was actually... Um, <laughs> uh, You're playing you. Devil's Advocate. I was playing the Devil's Advocate. Um, but one of the things I do think about dice is they're tactile. And people like picking up dice and rolling dice. Yes, and that's okay. what I was going back to, to yes. when I said earlier about that game with no dice. It was the fact you, you, you wanted to pick up dice and roll. Them. Maybe that's because we've been conditioned, conditioned to want to do that. But I do think there's something attractive about rolling a handful of dice. Now, picking up on that point, I think mm. it is attractive to roll a handful mm. of dice because mm. people think that they are um, able to um, basically have a result. Um, but what happens if with an opposed roll and nothing happens? Because I know mm. a number of people would criticise um, that potentially. Well, the potential for you to nothing you happening. to strike my you to strike me and I defend me. And the outcome is nothing happens. Yeah. Isn't that not reasonable? You know, in, in combat, um, people don't die all the time. You do, you do get huge, huge, uh, you get tipping points in combat where you work up, work up, work up, and it's almost attritional. And then you reach a tipping point where one side, mm. one side is going to lose, one side is collapsing, and away you go from there. Um, I don't have it. I don't have any issues with having a game where you attack me and I defend and nothing happens. The only problem is if that happens perpetually. Yeah, if yeah. that if we play a game and that happens five turns in the row, then the game design mechanism is wrong. You, you should be able to have a draw and yes, the combat continues in the next phase or turn or whatever you want to call it. However, that shouldn't be. The, the normal outcome that happens time and time again, because if so, the game design is wrong. Um, yeah, but also the other thing that's wrong there is that actually nothing happens isn't the correct definition either, is right. it? We're, we're mm-hmm. saying nothing happens in terms of moving the game to its next point, mm-hmm. but actually it's not nothing has happened, something has happened, it's just not been worthy of recording mm-hmm. in, that, in that particular aspect of it. So it's not, since it's like you, you've defended yourself, mm-hmm. He has attacked you and you have defended you. That's yeah. what's happened. That's, that's what's, what's happened. happened yeah. Nothing happened is, is the wrong word to use. It's a resetting mm-hmm. point, isn't it? And yeah. I felt that when nothing happened in mm-hmm. games of flashy plays, that was good because that's the point at which the two characters look at each other and they either try and psych each other out or they mm-hmm. snarl or they hurl an insult. Or there's a quip which is made by one of D'Artagnan's followers to the Somebody traps a cat. Or somebody, yes, yeah, somebody throws a, a vase or a cat at the yeah. opposition. I mean, just to finish off, though, we talked about dice a lot. Are there any other ways? Of opposed pitching? dice. I want to talk about opposed oh. dice rolls and how yeah, much fun yeah. that is. Because when we are, when we're talking about, um, uh, I don't know, it, it, my infantry firing at your infantry or my anti tank gun firing at your tank, I roll X number of dice, and the potential range of outcomes is Y. Okay, uh, the possibility I can get is no hits or ten hits because I'm rolling ten dice. That is predictable to a degree because we're rolling 10 dice, so we're going to get that bell curve. But then if we want to throw a disruptor into that, that allows you to then roll your, your defensive dice, which is effectively me bowling and you defending your wicket. Yeah. And that then creates a wider outcome of results. And it's that wider outcome of results, I think, that can often create that situation where you feel that nothing is happening. But in a firefight, often you feel that nothing is happening because you neither side has done sufficient to, to change their opponent's mental, physical situation. But then you do get to that tipping point where the combat, where the combat is won. The issue is, as I say, if that happens too often, that, that you get that result, which is perceived by some people as nothing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they are good points in games, things like opposed roles, and you wouldn't want to have a game without something where there is a direct, direct diametric opposition between the two forces. It's, it's, again, it's about the theatre of the game. It is. I yeah. bowl, it's like cricket, I or, or whatever, the baseball or whatever, I bowl <laughs> at you, so I've done my bit, I've done my bit to the best of my ability, you then 
hit the ball or miss the ball or do your bit to the best of your ability. So it's 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 why games like that work because there's there's two sides on the pitch. Yeah, yeah. So just to roll off and finish, uh, no pun intended. Mm. Otherwise, uh, other ways of getting randomness in a war game. If we didn't have that, something we could use spoons. Time. I could throw spoons at you. Well, one of the interesting things is when I was up with Charlie, um, he showed me a book which was um, Sea Battle Games, and I, it was published in 1970. So this was before um, polyhedral dice came in, a really old war game mm-hmm. book, and a lot of the mechanisms for introducing randomness were through a normal pack of playing cards, right. um, yeah. which you know we would never see these days. Yeah, you know, some people do. Does some some games out there do. I'm lacking in my knowledge on that. Well, I think dice and cards together can make a, a nice mix of, of methodologies, really, because you've got the dice, obviously, that are interesting, and then the cards themselves create a different dimension, so you can layer one on the other to make, again, you know, things slightly more fun and interesting. It's about fun and interest, isn't it? I'll, you want to engage you in the game, and I've used various methods to do that. All, all, uh, all dice about, and often cards are used in a similar way, is to create... Um, predictability, uncertainty, um, to introduce the elements where you have probability but you don't have any certainty. They can all be used to, to do that. You can pile it on or you can go light. It's the amount of sugar you want to, salt you want to put on your dinner or the amount of sugar you want to put on your whatever you put in your tea or whatever. How much you want is a personal choice. How much of that friction you want and uncertainty you want in your games is entirely up to you. Um, and to what degree we build that into games is, is kind of a, a game design choice. If we, if we made the games totally anarchic, <coughs> people wouldn't want to play it. It's really interesting. And I think pretty much an endless subject that we could discuss for hours. However, mentioning putting salt on food does remind me yeah. that we've got lunch booked at a local auberge and the maitre d' is a stickler for punctuality. So I've asked mm-hmm. um, Parker to drive us over there. I'm not sure where he is at the moment. I'll have to give him a call. Um, but I think that's all we have time for today. It's been great to get together here, uh, especially such a gloriously sunny day. Thank you, all the listeners, for joining us. Uh, this oddcast would be a very sad place without you. And to that end, we're going to do an Ask Sydney show in the next podcast. So please do, please do send us in any questions you'd like to put to us for that. Um, But for now, I'd like to thank Richard and Nick as my guests. And thank you, listeners, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Cheerio. Sydney Roundwood was joined by Nick Skinner and Richard Clark with music by Roger Barraclough and his band.